Hi, and welcome to Axel Bank Reports History and Today Conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. I'm Evan Axel Bank, and today we're going to speak with Hadassah Lieberman, the author of Hadassah, an American Story. She's best known for nearly becoming second lady of the United States. Thanks so much for being here, Ms. Lieberman. Thank you so much, Evan. I really appreciate it. I appreciate we, being here. Um, and we're, appreci- we're appreciative of you being here. Um, before we start our interview, I do want to invite listeners to our Patreon page. To ask for your support in keeping the show going, go to patreon.com slash History. We will donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. Sometime during the late hours of Tuesday, November 7th in the year 2000, Hadassah Lieberman was one of millions of Americans who thought her husband, Joe, was going to become vice president of the United States. 36 days later, the Gores and Liebermans were almost, as Joe says in the foreword to this book, she had an impressive career meeting Hadassah, which he jokes that he ruined when they got married in 1983. Mm-hmm. Um, this book is about setting that perception straight. Uh, let's start here. Decades before 1948, Hadassah is born in Prague to two Holocaust survivors. Her grandmother had indeed been murdered at Auschwitz. How old were you, Hadassah, when you became aware of what happened to your family? And how did those lessons begin to shape your view of the world? Well, I came here when I was 10 months old, so I was truly a baby. And the only things I know is that when I was on the boat immigrating to this country, my mother said everyone was sick and vomiting, and little Hadassika was being held by the captain, walking around, and we're all vomiting, and she's smiling. So that was my first introduction. And later, my mother used to talk about Emma Lazarus and coming to the Statue of Liberty and going into America, that it was so amazing. Particularly, my mother knew a few words here and there in English. My father didn't. And to come with the language, that which was Yiddish at that point in time, and to enter into kindergarten, in Gardner, Massachusetts, which is a half an hour from the New Hampshire border. And believe me, at the point that we were using Yiddish, I'm not sure how many knew any of the words. And when I came home, my mother asked me in Yiddish, how was your first day in kindergarten? And I said, mommy, no more Yiddish, only English. So she remembers that, although at the same time, I had to wear my braids or my ponytail, and my mother didn't like me to be in, you know, sloppy dresses, sloppy pants. So I had to go in dresses, and I'd say, Mommy, no one else is wearing dresses. They're all wearing pants, and their hair is straight down. Anyway, so what I knew about the U.S., was from my parents' accounts back to me. My uh, grandmother, if she was still around, she would she she mourned the loss of Yiddish uh, from from Jewish culture as time went on. Um, Two thousand four, your book kind of starts here. You were cleaning out the last of your parents' belongings from their apartment in Riverdale. And um, by the right. way, uh, I am from Van Cortland Park, so I know Riverdale pretty well. Um, you found your mother's diary, which was written in Czech. And when you translated it in your book, you say it was clear she was trying to write from memory what she had been through. And she says, maybe one day you'll say to the world what I could not. She had nightmares that would wake you up sometimes in the middle of the night. Um, And who could blame her, right? Uh, She was on a train to Auschwitz and and had been in Auschwitz with people yelling at her, you will not return. Uh, What do you think that does to someone? What did that do to your mother? Well, what did that do to my mother? And really, part of your question that I answer without your initial articulation, what did it do to me? When you ask me the reactions of the Holocaust, well, I was a little kid. My mother was screaming, nightmares, nightmares, just screaming. And we all knew the bottom of the dresser in her bedroom 
had a prison dress of stripes in it. And I remember asking mommy, what is this? And she said, it's my prison dress from Auschwitz. So these were the kind of things that emerged while simultaneously you're trying to be an immigrant with a new language, with new customs, with new food. Did you ever ask why were you, do you remember? I mean, maybe you did. I'm not sure if you remember. Why were you in prison? Did you ever ask that? Ask my mother that? Yeah. No, because I knew why the Nazis, I knew about that the Nazis had taken her to Auschwitz. Literally, I have the story in the book about how they came into her home in Prague, Czechoslovakia, which is what it was called at that time. And I knew when my father was at a slave labor camp. So I didn't have any question about why were you taken there? They were taken because they were Jewish. And so that's why today, earlier today, a dear friend who's an artist, Mindy Weisel, many have heard about her. Oh, you know mentioned her, her in the art. book. Yeah. I mentioned her in the book very close. And Mindy Weisel was painting. And today she sent me a tape of a medal she was given the German embassy by the German ambassador in Israel, where she lives now with her husband. And they were talking about the light she brought out of an early darkness of light in her paintings, trying to meet with young people, Nazis, children, and to try to put a positive step on the future. So that was all, you know, Mindy and I both through my book, I'd hoped to put some light into the future that we experienced when we came struggling with all those new things to learn. Why did you think it was so important? Um, and there is detail in your book that's very difficult to read as, read as so many of the details of the Holocaust and what it did to people. Why did you think it was important to have that detail in the book and not gloss it over, um, just given how much hate we see in the world today? Because we have to learn. And we have no one to blame than ourselves if we don't learn from the past. In Hebrew, it's Ein Brera, means we have no other choice but to push ourselves forward to learn and to teach. Yes, I deal with the details, and my parents didn't deal with them every day. We had a cousin who dealt with it every day that sat down to a meal. She said, oh, we didn't have this food in Auschwitz, so we didn't have anything to drink, on and on. But the details, and as I read the details and I look at some of the books that I read today, and I hear again the horrible history and pain and ugliness that we as Jews suffered, and how do you communicate that without, you know, want to damage children? But we have to learn part of our past, and that's what's so scary because. Scary because we know that part of our past developed earlier with words and catcalls and ugly stuff. So, of course, we're paranoid about hearing anything negative, and we have to be careful to learn. Your dad was, I want to talk about your dad because we talked about your mother also, but uh, your dad was one of the few to survive a forced march. Um, I, I hope I get all the details right, but he said that. Um, even when they were liberated from their prisons, they were hardly satisfied given the fear that they had been conditioned to live in. So here are people who have been marched hundreds of miles, maybe, or dozens or hundreds of miles, not sure how many, but uh, you're forced to march in horrendous conditions and you still can't even feel relief when you're liberated. And he said that Hitler's, um, uh, I may never forget this, he said Hitler's promise to make Jews forget how to laugh was achieved. Your dad said that. When, uh, when or did, did he learn to laugh again? Ben. 
baking from our childhood just sticks in the memory, doesn't it? We never set off on holiday without piles of Tupperware. And there'd always be Bakewell slice, flapjacks and tray baked scones in the boot. Do you not do that, Lisa? No. (laughs) Sadly, I do not stack uh, the Tupperware in the back of the car when we go off on holiday. Welcome to Small Ways to Live Well, a new podcast from The Simple Things magazine. Season two is a pick-me-up tonic that helps us make the shift from winter to spring. A six-week suggestion box full of things to note, notice and enjoy about the season. Search for Small Ways to Live Well on your podcast app. Well, you know, you re-enter life and you have two children and you have their laughter but it's just they're burnt inside. They're burnt inside. So we did the best we could. My mother was a beautiful woman. I have all kinds of pictures in the book to share because I felt, you know, I need to show her before and after. And we worked hard. And, you know, I did, I write about it in the book, how I want, I was the winner of the I Speak for Democracy contest in high school. So I still remember the congressman at that time when I won for this area. I don't remember if it was the state or the area. And I was in a car with him riding through the streets Memorial Day. My parents always went to all those kinds of national holidays because They were thankful and appreciated the United States. And my parents were at the side of the road. I'm in this white convertible waving to me. And, you know, I still remember the tears and rolling down their cheeks because to have your daughter suddenly appear with a congressman in the United States after you've escaped alive from Auschwitz and slave labor camps. So, Baruch Hashem, I really, look, that's, that's me. So that here I was in America and with a husband who was in national politics and state politics. And I always stood there underneath, inside, as a survivor's daughter, responsible for carrying the message forward and laughing and crying. How did your view of, how is your view of the American immigration political football and also legitimate issue today that, um, how is it all formed based on your experience and on your parents' experience coming to this country? Well, based on my parents' experience and mine that I realized later on, um, never forget when we came into Gardner. Well, first it was in Prague. My father was signing my name with the authorities. And he said, I want to make it Esther, because that was my grandmother who had died. And the authority said, oh, that's a German name. Find another name. So my father translated Esther into Hadassah. And then when we finally came to the United States in Gardner, Massachusetts, the nuns were helping us sign documents, the local nuns in the vicinity. And my father said, her name will be Esther, not Hadassah. And the nuns said to him, oh, Rabbi, Hadassah is such a beautiful name. Keep it Hadassah. So what an incredible American story that the nun asked my father. So there were so many stories like that And so many times people reach their hands out to us and appreciated who we were. And my father, who was the head of the ministerial association, when he came to this country, he was a lawyer, but he wasn't going to go back to law school to become a lawyer in the United States. So he took his rabbinical degree, which he had had in the early years of his life in Czechoslovakia. And he was so interested in everything. And he remembered one of the ministers 
were saying things on the radio that he felt were borderline anti-Semitism. And he called the reverend, who ended up being close with my father after he spoke with him for hours at a time. And he actually, my father, actually changed this reverend. So these were the kinds of things that I experienced and I was taught as my father listened to the tape recorder night after night to try to produce normal English for sermons. And my mother just sort of floundered through. She knew seven languages, and so mm. she was going to get another. That's not really floundering, but... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, tell us about, about your early years and about how you transition into adulthood. Uh, many of us know you, of course, um, um, or at least feel like we know you from seeing you in, in national politics, as, uh, as you put it. Um, uh, what choices were you making as you embarked on a career? And, and where did you go to school? And uh, it was fascinating to read you majored in Chinese studies and then international uh, relations. Yes. Well, my first two years, I, well, first of all, I had Gardner High School and that was, you know, that was a high school. So it was fun, small New England high school. And, you know, I knew that I had to make my parents proud with what I achieved in school. And they were pretty strict about that, you know, that I had to keep my reputation solid and this and that. And my dad actually went and, you know, had fun times in high school and, a girlfriend who was across the street, Patty Gallant, who was a real Catholic young woman who would come over and say, oh, Shabbat, I will take care of the lights. You know, she was so cute. And she came in, she knew everything changed every week with the time. And then I had to make a decision about college and where I was going to go. And my daddy, I think I talk about it in the book, my daddy took me to, I wanted to look at Boston University and he mm -hmm. took me there. And as soon as he started walking through the school, he saw couples sitting on the couches smooching. Well, that was the end of that school for me. <laughs> not good and enough he said, for Dawson. No, not good enough. So he sent me to... Yeshiva University, Stern College, the women's division for two years. And then I decided I was interested in Chinese politics and theater education. And so I went transferred to Boston University, which was a whole other place and attended their Hillel house every Shabbat, of course. And that was fun being in Massachusetts and having parents ride into Boston and give me food and an aunt, you know, gave me food, food that some of these kids had never heard of ever in their life. And that hopefully was they just did the, your laundry when they were in town, right? They did as they <laughs> took what they could. They took what they could. But then my parents were, did not spoil me. They sort of knew I had to learn to get along. And it was amazing because then I went to, I was at Boston University and the Northeastern earlier in American government and, and Boston University theater education as well as Chinese politics. So, you know, I had a rounded education with the communities and with everything. New York was a totally different experience for me, obviously, when I transferred there. And I liked it. It was fun. And... My dad used to say, because he, he had grown up in a very orthodox, which is the more religious um, section of the religion of Judaism. And he used to say, you know, when you're in New York, some of the reformed temples have opera on Friday night singing the service. So you should go just to be mindful to see things. So he thought, you know, that to him was like escaping to a nightclub or something. Yeah. So I did it. And um, I think there was so much. And, you know, you dating and meeting people. And remember 
my one very close girlfriend, who actually was the source of Joe Lieberman eventually, but she was so um, amazed about everything. And we used to go on these blind dates because she was at Stern College for me. And we would buy candy in advance and pass the candy over the guys in the movie because we were just interested to yeah. such an extent that we were just going to eat candy. But all of those things are fun, just normal stuff. And actually a totally abnormal concept that it, it originates from with my parents. And I had to learn to be, and I had to learn for parties that I write about in, in, you know, my mother dressing in a geisha costume and walking a derves around our garage so the high school kids could have some fun Japanese kosher food. <laughs> well, one of the things you say in your book is that you wrote your book to help people. Um, and I didn't know this about you and, and Joe Lieberman, that you were both uh, on your second marriage. Um, uh, and... Um, I didn't know that. And so I'd just be curious, um, why did you want to make sure to tell your experience about being divorced and then finding each other? And tell us the great story of how you found each other. Because one of my favorite biographers who we've actually had on the show, David Mar uh, Marinus, says, um, life is just a series of accidents that kind of coincide to make it a whole existence. So true. So true. Well, first of all, I was married to someone I met in Boston and we were married we had our son and I only wanted to convey especially about divorce because so many people make so, and each divorce is different so my advice that I gave in the book was for my divorce everyone's different but I just emphasized and I always do that who you marry that's your first marriage that's your first child and you can't be horrible about it and negative because you literally can hurt your first child your first children and you have to pay respect to each other and not ever say anything bad to your shared child and joe and i when we met, after I got divorced, obviously, within time, I was just so amazed, he and I, and I really wouldn't if he wasn't loving and understanding of everything I believed regarding my son, I would never have married him or he, me. We're very close with our children. And it was the hardest, hardest thing that you go through. And I remember. You know, the kids would come Wednesday to Sunday every week, and they were teenagers, and there were always things that they were upset about. And they'd go down the basement, and I'd hear them, you know, talking loudly. I'd go up to my bedroom. I wasn't part of that. And it took time, and I had a neighbor in New Haven who I really love, very close, and her brother-in-law would come visit her he's no longer alive and he was a psychiatrist and I remember visiting with him and the beginning of our marriage I said to him how long does it take to make it work with someone who's some kids who are not your children and he said about five years I said five years nothing takes me five years five years and he was right he was right. You have to cry. You have to shut your mouth. The big thing is to shut your mouth and realize, because I had so many experiences. I remember, you know, the kids at the kitchen table having to have dinner or breakfast. And I remember Eitan saying to me, well, he was six. And he said, they're not talking to you so much. So don't talk to them, mommy. And I was thinking he's six. And he gets it. So thank God, never use the word stepchild. I address all of our children as all of our children together. And never, and our grandchildren, we have, God bless them, 12 grandchildren. And they all call 
Poppy, Pop, Grandpa, Poppy, not Grandpa, and Safta, Mom, Grandma. So having all of them, whether we gave birth to their parents or not, as one family is so important. And to give them all equal share, shares of whatever you have. Tell us the fabulous meeting story. Oh, Joe and I. So I was, you know, I was meeting different people, blah, blah, blah. And my girlfriend who went to Stern College with me and then went on to Boston University, um, some tough courses she was taking. I remember I was dating different people and I don't think she, I think she was hoping for something better for me. So she said to me, I really want you to meet someone else too for you. So I thought, oh, so she said, there's someone in New Haven at our synagogue and he goes there. I'd like you to meet him. And you know what, Eitan, your son looks a little like him. And I thought, what a weird introduction to meet him. So- you look like my son. Yeah. yeah. I'd recommend so, against that as a pickup line, right? Oh, definitely. <laughs> and um, so he came, she lived in New Haven and I stayed with her for Shabbat. And the next day on Shabbat, I was sitting out in the yard reading and he came over to meet me during the day, just said hello, and, and I didn't know him, and I didn't really know. She said, oh, he's a politician, but he's a good guy. Were, were, you, were you nervous about being in a relationship with a politician? I, I read, I mean, I didn't know this, but I read that he was already a state legislator and was going to be running for oh, attorney general. Yeah, yeah he, was, he was in a campaign running for yeah. attorney general. No, did, I, did that I, scare I, you or no? No, not at all. It was, you know, if he was, a, if he was someone of interest, I'd meet him. If he wasn't, I wouldn't. I don't hmm. care. So I just, um, that was before all the, uh, the runs that I, you know, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, let me drink some. Yeah. He took you through so a few the, campaigns, I guess. Oh yeah. So there he was and he met me and he said, um, well, I'd like to take you out tonight. So this is the politician part. What was he doing that? He said, well, it's the only time I have free time. I have an event in Connecticut and I must go to it. It was a fundraiser for him. So I thought, okay, but when I get there, how do I introduce nobody? You know, here it is. Right, right. This is our first date. Yeah. <laughs> Say hey fever. So our first date and he said, just tell them you're my driver. So that was my first intro to politics. And I was there. Well, we got back to New Haven. I was supposed to be brought back to my girlfriend's house. And we went out for drinks. And we didn't get back to like 1 a.m. or whatever and it closed. And there I was. And Joe said to me, well, you know, I like to sit down and talk to you for a bit. I do have a fundraiser in Hartford tomorrow morning, very early in the morning. So I have to get back. Well, that was the beginning of my introduction to politics. But I liked him. Now I heard he had two teenagers. I thought, oh my God. And my father, <laughs> who always gave advice, said, uh, Dasika, remember, <coughs> I'll take out all the coughing there for you. Okay. <laughs> Let me just take some more. Yeah, please. It's my throat with this hay fever. Oh, anyway. Sorry. I hope you're all right. And no, it's okay. And um, so there I was. And my father said to me, remember, teenagers are bad to begin with. <laughs> Not, not easy, but to have two steps who were teenagers, you know. So that was my introduction. But we started dating, and Joey was in the middle of this attorney general campaign. And I was going, when I could, I went places with him. And Joe's father, because we drive Joe's father, said, the two of you 
uh, killing yourself with so much driving. You know, Did I was you enjoy to- it? Did you enjoy being part of this and being thrust into this world? Yeah, I mean, it was okay. I didn't have a pro- <laughs> I used to go to, I used to go to things with Senator Moynihan helping with their yeah. fundraising. Yeah, I saw I'm used to that. Plus I was a rabbi's daughter. So yeah. you always have to watch Politician, right? Day. That's like a politician, yeah. Yeah, it's just another, right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Especially with my father who didn't like everything I did, you know, every time. So it was really, it was an amazing time. And we were falling in love. I hadn't met, and then I had to meet his kids and they seemed nice. But my, I never called Becca and I were close, you know, the girl in the family. But then as soon as we were going to get married, she wasn't so sure how nice she wanted to be. And so she said, months later, she said, I was so hard work at just trying to distance myself from you. I can't do it. And she said, and my book quotes Matt and Becca and Aton. And honey, and at first, you know, people that were looking at the book said, well, maybe this is a book about you. Why do you have your children? I said, are you kidding? That's the beautiful part. And that's part of my story about divorce. That's part of my story about you have to make a family very strong and children very strong. They have to lean. And that takes a few years. And now there's nothing I can't ask of them. You were working at Pfizer. Uh, Joe, as I mentioned, um, said he interrupted your career. and I'm sure changed it quite a bit. Uh, what, what happened to your career? What were you doing? And, and what choices did you make around that? Well, I was first at um, Lehman Brothers. And then the whole, everything we know subsequently that happened to Wall Street. And I was an analyst working with a full, you know, as an assistant. And then Pfizer directed policy communications for them because there were a lot of issues and things I was involved with. And, and it was in Manhattan. And when I met Joe, I was, had just left Pfizer and just a lot of stuff was going on. And I remember everything because that was before these days in the senate where a lot more is allowed for women to do as we know but then everything's a conflict of interest and there's always a lawyer in house who's saying well that's a problem or you can't do this so i just found myself and then i went to coleman and i did a lot of different things and i count that in the in the book and it was hard because you couldn't do everything. Look, subsequent politicians and their spouses, it was somewhat shocking sometimes because we never said everything that was on our minds and we were careful. And I always appreciated that, look, Joe has people that love him. Joe has people that hate him. Joe is what, what you see is what he is. And so that alone can be a problem for either side because he speaks the way he wants to speak and believes. He doesn't play play games. One scene in the book that I thought was incredible was when Joe is being sworn in or maybe soon after um, he's sworn in and you felt this was a message being sent to Hitler. I absolutely, I will never forget that moment, which I recount in the book of going into the Senate chamber, which you don't do. They never, you know, let you go in. But as a spouse, it was orientation day. And we were sitting there and they were orienting us to things. And then whoever was doing it left. And Joe and I were in the seats. And I saw Joe looking around at the photographs and all the different people. And Joe, I said to Joe, Joey, you're looking around. What are you thinking? He said, I'm thinking how lucky I am to be in the midst of this history and to see these heroes around me. And here I am being sworn in 
to this shortly. And I looked at him and he said, what are you thinking? I said, Joey, I'm thinking my fist is in the air to Hitler. Here I am sitting here in the midst of what my husband describes to know that my parents survived this amazing, horrible, horrible story. So that's what happened to me as I sat there. So I wanted to recount it later. There were some difficulties. Uh, there were some death threats that came in. Um, did you ever get close as he rose through the ranks in the Senate and became someone of national prominence? Did you ever say, Joe, you got to get out of this. I can't take this anymore. And if I assume if not, why, why, why did, why were you no. able to gather the strength to keep going? In that? No, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that ever. He was, no, you can't run away from things. We were very well protected during the campaigns. We knew we couldn't even open the door and walk out till you were told. And I love and the story really, about how on Shabbat you were escorted uh, or he was escorted to vote. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He was escorted down to vote and back to vote. As a matter of fact, I also think I have it in the book as well. Had this Friday night dinner sitting there with several people we had invited. And Joe, of course, was at the Capitol. And there, there we are, Friday night. I get a phone call. They've elongated the night for a vote. And I'm thinking, oh, good. I have these people coming for Shabbat. Okay, so I had it all set up. And I did the food, da, da, da. And then they came in. They were sitting there. And I said, I'm really sorry. I hope Joe will come home later walking. And I didn't even, I don't even think I said walking. I just said, come home later. So sure enough, we sat there and I did Kiddush and Motsi, all the traditional things that we do in a Jewish traditional home. And it was amazing because around the main course being put on the table, I hear the door jiggling with the key and it's Joey. He came out and it was raining and hot. And I don't know. He walks in and there all the people at the table are saying, oh, my God. I said, yeah, oh, Joey, he was so hot because he'd walked, you know, I don't know if it's four miles. I forget, five miles. And they thought that he would take a ride with the Capitol Police, but he wouldn't walk. And he walked. He washed his hands, he put his jacket down, and sat down at the Shabbat table and caught up with us. So those are the kinds of combinations when you say random events. I could say things that we are part of, that are our tradition, that are who we are. And that may happen with a vote, without a vote, with company, with you know, you learn not to invite people to dinner for that reason, unless yeah. they're in the neighborhood. Right, you right. really do. You got to leave. Um, I, I'll, I'll never forget when, when the Senator uh, Lieberman was picked to be Al Gore's running mate. Um, I'll never forget the headline. I think it was Newsweek and it said chutzpah. Um, in other words, Al Gore had taken this kind of leap to put a Jewish person on a national ticket. Um, there was a lot of speculation about what the impact of that would be. Um, what do you see looking back? I can't believe it. 20 years now, 21 years now. I know. Um, what, 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 is the, what do you see as having been the impact of Senator Lieberman's presence on the Gore-Lieberman ticket? Well, there are so many stories of impact. I will never forget one of the reporters was telling the story that he was told he had to wait to be told about Joe till 3 a.m. the morning, you know, and he had to wait. And he said he never forgets how he was sitting there and waiting and waiting. And then he said, 
I think it was to Vice President Gore, someone in that vicinity of things. And he said to Gore, well, who is it? Is it? And he started to name all the candidates for the 2000 race for VP. And the answer was no, no, no. And then all of a sudden, the reporter said, oh my God, is Joe Lieberman the first Jewish candidate in this national campaign? And that's who it was. And he was shocked. And he just went out of there writing. And everyone was overwhelmed. And you know what? Al Gore told the joke. It wasn't a joke, he, the, the uh, story that ended up being funny, that when he was making the decision of who he would change, choose, wait, let me put this down. When he was making that decision, he felt very strongly that he wanted to ask some group of Jewish supporters and colleagues, and they said, well, they might be concerned that there might be a reaction. Then he went to Christian colleagues, and they said, Joe Lieberman, absolutely no problem. Don't even think about it. There's no problem with being Jewish. And that's how it ended up. And that was a very strong moment. And, you know, I always think about Joe, and that's part of why I also wanted to write this book. Now, he's written his books, he said yeah. what he said, but I wanted to make the point that as a Holocaust survivor's daughter, what an amazing story, despite the foggy blackness in the past, and that continues with some people today. What was it like for you to become an entirely public person? That's tough. That's tough. And I was thinking of people, now Tipper gets it, because that's how she's, you know, lived. And it's, it's your whole life. Everything you do, I will never forget, you know, I was sitting in the front of some building, I don't know if it was church service, I remember, I, my back was facing everyone behind me, and I was told, oh, you've got to smile more, or you can't do this, or you can't do that, and in your whole life, I remember Joe was coming into Florida, I don't remember where he was, because I was traveling around the country, making stops all over the place. And Joe came back and he was sitting in the car talking to a staff person, you know, about things that needed to be done. I was standing next to my car and looking and I was starting to get, ugh, I hadn't seen him for a while. And here we are again. And you blah, tell blah, the story blah. in the book. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's the story. And I was just, so, and then what happened is Joe's looking at me and he says, smile. Because <laughs> every all the camera and that's what you got to do. Your life, except some people and some candidates and some winners, didn't do it the way we did it. So maybe they were liberated from that moment, or maybe punished for not listening. I said twenty-one years. I can't believe it. I remember it like mm -hmm. it was yesterday, sitting there watching the TV late that night. Um, how often? do you lose sleep over the change in direction the country took because of that election? Um, it's clear today that Gore Lieberman would have been an entirely different agenda and destiny than Bush Cheney. Well, you know, we talk about it. We don't, we're not obsessed. We're not <laughs> crazed. I think, you know, we have so much, we're going forward. There's so much in our lives and there's so many people in our family and Joe is, very involved with no labels and his book that he's coming out with now is about a non a bipartisan importance to make friends 
amongst legislators to each other to produce solid results in legislation. But the truth is that we look at it every now and then and say, oh my God, because there were more votes and it's just the whole electoral college, you know, everything. We've gone over it for years and it doesn't matter, we're still in the same boat and the same activity in elections. But look, that's the reality of American democracy. You can never, we thought we were gonna win. I'll never forget, it was Friday that Gore would call over before Shabbat and we were almost at the point, but they, we weren't yet at the point of determining the votes in the election. And we all know that because we followed through. And Gore called back, Al called back after the conversation and said, why don't you come over for Shabbat? So I took a bag, put my candles, put my food, everything in it, and the cops took us over to Gore's. And we set an area for Shabbat. And Joe said to me, and to Gore, he needs a place to daven. So they took him into, the, and that was the year, as you can recall, that Christmas was later everything now later it was just the dates were all screwed up with the election and we were still that was christmas time that the election was still unfinished and so we sat there with donna brazil and we talked about psalms we talked about shabbat it was very very special but you say you're not obsessed with the results and thinking about what might have been no because you can't do that. It's an election. It's hard to get. Joe went to work the very next day because he said, I'm in the Senate. I got to do my job. And that's it. So when you're dealing with a man who's like that, what are you going to do? Sit there crying? And you know what? Life is an educator. Because who knew what we would see the last few years? Well, it's a whole I, different world. And I want to ask, given how much time you've spent in Washington, you've probably been in the Capitol building a thousand times. Um, thousand times. Thousands of times. Um, given how much time you've spent there, what was it like to witness January 6th? Horrible. It was a hard, you know, I used to walk into the Capitol. Everyone else did. I had my card. I couldn't walk in. I, Hadassah Lieberman, married to a senator while he was in the Senate. I had a card to walk in. Those guys, the, the, the cops knew everyone. They knew the identity. We were never allowed. Whoever thought you could just walk in? It, I never saw anything like it. And it made me afraid. Who are we? What are we becoming? We have to solve those problems. And I understand here we are going again with all the questions and all the curses and all the stuff. Bannon has his view and he's pursuing his view. We have a new president and we have to, as much as it's of interest to many or several, we have to stop covering an ex-president that much. We have to go forward and protect ourselves and talk to each other regardless of democrat republican how much of all this stuff echoes in your head given um well let me ask it this way um how much of what we're seeing right now echoes in your head of um authoritarianism and given you know what has happened what can happen so well um you know where do you fall on this? How, how concerned are you that we're headed down a dangerous, a dangerous path? I'm very concerned. I don't want to, you know, I, it scares me. It scares me from where I'm from and from all the readings that I've done about what came before, before Nazism. 
to read the histories, the biographies, to know what went on from family. I, you know, my husband keeps saying, we're a democracy, we're strong. Most people are not on one side or the other, but in fact, the internet, which has given us so much and continues to fill us with more and more in the way of knowledge, answering questions, it also brings together forces, opinions in the world that really are not so large, but online they appear to be larger and more serious. And that's detrimental to our thinking. So as an immigrant, I'm concerned. I don't like it. I don't want to yell, I'm afraid, even though that's part of my feelings, because we have to remain strong and we have to not allow this to go on. We got to figure out how we stop it. I saved this for the end because I thought it was the most moving part of the book. Uh, in 1995, you went back to Auschwitz. You were invited by the Clinton White House. Um, what was it like to go back there? I believe it was the first time you'd been been back yes. there. Um, what was it like to go back there to a place that defined your family and defined your family's future? And in part, for part of that walk, my arm in Ellie Wiesel's arm, I mean, that in and of itself also told a story. I was like shocked when I went back to Auschwitz and I hadn't been to Germany at all. And I'd heard some of the stories from my mother about Auschwitz and in her diary that I included in my early chapters of the book hearing my mother's, reading my mother's words about how her sister was hit with a whip and just all the awful things that people have read and know about. But it was a extraordinary trip. And there I was representing the United States and the wife of a U.S. Senator. So I was proud that I came to that point and sad for all the graves and for all the people who never made a grave. Did you find yourself imagining or thinking about, this is what my sister, this is what my mother, this is what my aunt would have seen? This is where they were standing? Oh, for sure. The latrines, I remember my mother describing things, the bunks, the, yeah. It's scary. And then all, you know, the prison dress that I saw in my mother seeing it on view in the Holocaust Museum. Everything. It's just an awful, but it's important to remember and not repeat. And it's important. The phrase tikkun olam in Hebrew means repairing the world. And it's our obligation as good citizens to work hard in our communities to repair the world, how, no matter how small that sphere is and how large it can become. Hadassah Lieberman, author of Hadassah, An American Story. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And my best to your family. Thank you. You too. Um, more information on her book can be found at the website for the Brandeis University Press. I want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We will donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. And thank you for listening to Axelbank Reports, History, and Today, conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Axelbank History. We update those with clips from the show, guest announcements, and book recommendations. We'll see you next time. Thanks.